we're starting a new series today called The Sermon on the Mount. Uh, prior to Christmas and a little bit after Christmas, we did a series on the Beatitudes, which is the preamble to the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is almost like the second Ten Commandments, where Jesus unbelievable, the teaching that Jesus does in this, it is revolutionary. It will shape and change your life like you never believe. In fact, the, 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 the depiction of Jesus that our culture has is so counter, counter culture to what he actually says and what he tells us to do. Now, I don't have time to go back to the Beatitudes, but the Beatitudes are actually what we are to become. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn, for they should be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they should inherit the earth. Blessed are those who persecute you. And all these things are the attributes of what God can do through us, no matter who you are. That God works for broken people. God works for people who mourn. God works for people who are humble and meek. And these are the attributes and what you are. And now we get into the Sermon on the Mount, which now gets how to actualize this. Jesus was speaking to a group of us, a disciples. He brought them on the, up on the mount right next to the Sea of Galilee. And as he was speaking to his own people, the other crowds began to happen. So there was the people that were informed and those that were not informed yet. And somehow that's, that's often like church. We have people here this morning that love Jesus, are following Jesus. Other folks are trying to check it out and see what's going on. And the news is it works for everybody, but especially when you give your life to Jesus Christ. So today we're going to talk about something about salt and light. You are salt and light in the world. You are salt and you are light. Look at your neighbor and say, you're salt. Look at your neighbor and say, you're also light. Say, stop assaulting me. So you are salt and you are light. And we're going to be talking about that today. What does that mean? Jesus is very specific. You see, unfortunately, we have this idea that all we're supposed to do is give our life to Jesus Christ, insulate ourselves from the world, stay in church, be in church, have friends that are in church, to stay in church, and don't get involved with the world because it's wicked, and that's all. Listen, if that was the purpose of the church, then as soon as you gave your life to Jesus, you'd be raptured into heaven. The reason why we're here is not only are we called to give our lives to Christ and be saved, but we are to continue the work of Jesus. He says, go, all authority has been given to me. Now I give it to you. Now go to all the earth. He doesn't say, stay in your churches and just listen to Caleb and eat Chick-fil-A. That's not what he says. <laughs> he tells us to go and make a difference in the world. And so salt and light. And so many of us, uh, we know this is fantastic. I love salt, especially on French fries. Can I hear an Amen. French fries without salt are terrible. It's sinful, but when you put a little salt on it. So a lot of us, we gather in these salt containers, which is great, right? And we get more salty together, but salt does no good until you begin to spill it out. Okay, you got your attention, didn't I? I'm not, act like I did something so violent. I just put a little salt on there, okay? That's what we're called to do, but salt. And we're also called to be light in the world. I'm gonna ask you to turn off the lights just for a second. What we wanna do is we wanna put our lights on. You see, right now, the darker it gets, the more, the more profound the light is. And this world needs light. This world is dark. And if we're like this, going around, I'm ashamed to be a Christian. I'm ashamed to be a Christian. Meanwhile, I'll go to a shopping mall someplace, and I'll see a, a gentleman put an oriental rug on the ground in the parking lot, face towards Mecca, and pray to Allah. And we're afraid to pray for our meals. Listen, this world needs the light. And you are the light. So today we're going to be talking about salt and light. I need the lights back, please. I'm, I'm blinded. Thank you. <laughs> now I get big blue things in my eyes. Hold on. All right. So God is calling us to be salt and light. What does that mean? You are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. That's what our, our job is, everybody. Our job is to be salt and light. We don't really understand what that means in our culture today. But I just want to share with you what salt and light is. Salt pervert, uh, not perverbs, <laughs> preserves society. Light gives light to darkness. And the church has been amazing through the ages. There's been people that have abused the name of Christ and were false and created a lot of problems. But you cannot deny this. The rise and fall of the Roman Empire talks about the church. And it wasn't even from a Christian author. 
Kenneth Latourette in his seven-volume series about the church and what it did throughout history, the impacts of Jesus through, 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 uh, through Christians. You know, children were considered just property. Children, what they would do if a child was born, they would wait seven or eight days before they named him because if they didn't like the child, they'd just throw it out. Just, I'm not serious, that's what they do. Just throw the child out. That's what they would do. But guess what began to happen? Believers began to collect these babies and put them in orphanages and raise them as their own. There'd be, uh, there'd be women, a lot of, a lot of female children, uh, babies thrown out, and their church would do it. Church is one of the first places to start orphanages. I don't know if you realize this. Churches gave dignity to children. How about women? Women were just, just property to be used. Men would have wives to raise families, have concubines and porcupines to have fun. That's what they would do. They were just to be thrown around. It meant nothing. They just used them for their own pleasure. What did the Bible do? The Bible stopped, stopped all this. And Jesus was the greatest woman liberator that ever was. Do you realize that the, the women helped support his ministry, which would be considered, well, you have having women support your ministry? He did that on purpose. Do you realize the first person to see Jesus when he rose again from the dead was not one of the 12 men disciples? It was a woman. Do you realize the first female evangelist was a woman? We talked about that last week at, uh, at um, John chapter four, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. Jesus gave dignity and power and grace to women. As a result, uh, I don't know if you realize this, but well, women, because of the church, became more prominent in society and were treated better. Also, the health uh, healthcare began. Do you realize during the Black Plagues and in the Middle Ages and all these horrible things that happened as people ran out of the cities, the church ran in to be a help in the middle of a crisis. And that's how they changed the world. Through education. I don't know if you realize this, but the first schools in America were to help children uh, to know about God and not go the wrong way. And so the first education in this church, in this, in this country, by the way, in Massachusetts, came by the church. Hospitals came by that. Do you realize that Yale, Princeton, Oxford, Harvard, all these schools began as a seminary? Yeah, I, I, that's right. You can see the charters of the school they began. They began to propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. They began seminaries and places to train up ministers of the gospel. That was one of the most important things that they did. We can see that happen. Economics and how we would help the poor. And that's what actually started to come into government systems as a result. We can see in art, music, and law. You can see even William Wilberforce in England, who, was, who gave his life to Christ, was introduced to John Newton, and he worked over 40 to 50 years in Parliament to get rid of slavery. His influence came over to the United States of America, even influenced our country in Abraham Lincoln, and the whole abolition movement happened because of believers. I'm just helping you to understand this, that the salt and the light much of our civilization came into being because we believe God is a God of order. Since he's a God of order, you can discover his order. And some of the greatest scientists, Mendel and different people like that, Newton, they all understood the importance of God and understood that God is a God of order. So all this through the impact of the church has been amazing. Now, has there been problems with the church? Of course there's been problems in the church. Jesus had 12 disciples and one guy was a tyrant named Judas who betrayed him for money, right? So listen, there's always gonna be people that are false, are false representatives. And the church has missed it many times. Yes, but by and large, the Bible has been the, has been the book and the people called Christians that really followers of Jesus, not just Christians, that means nothing. Followers and lovers of Jesus have changed the world and they continue to do such. Some of the most benevolent people in the world are believers. This whole idea of giving came from the church. Now, I'm not, this is not my opinion only. This is obvious through history. You can see. So we are called to be salt and light. Jesus says this in the Beatitudes. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Now, we don't understand salt too much in our culture, but a very important aspect of it, salt is in a Dead Sea, which is the lowest place on planet Earth, 1,300 feet below sea level. I've been there. We had a trip that went to Israel. I'd like to do another one. If you're interested, let us know. We'll probably uh, so, uh, get another one. I floated, not on this one. Uh, my pictures were so bad, I couldn't show you. 
he didn't want to see me, never mind. So I was floating in there, but it, it has so much salt because there's no place for the water to go. And what would happen is as it dehydrates the water, it would leave the salt behind, and it became a, a major area, almost like an oil field today. Their economy was based upon salt. In fact, the Latin word for salt, the Latin, actually the Latin word for salt, we got the word salary, and that's what salary comes for. Ever hear someone say, he's not worth his salt? They used to pay Roman soldiers with salt. Salt was extremely important in that day. In fact, it would preserve them. That's why you like the salted hams. The reason they have salted hams is because they didn't have refrigeration. And so they would rub the salt on the meat. So Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. So if we begin to lose our salt, Properties, what happens? Sodium chloride. Well, I was reading in a number of commentaries and also manners and customs of the Bible, and I'm not as brilliant as I think I have. I have a 2,000, 2,500 uh, volume library on my computer, and I, I can read and research, and, and that's what I do all week and pray. And, and so I've, I've done some research, and I found some things out and never heard before this past week. I found this out that on, on top of the roofs and many of the houses in Palestine in that day in Israel, they were flat. And what they would do, they would often meet up there and have lunch, and Peter had a nap up there and saw a vision. And so sometimes the roof would start to get leaky. So they'd have to put some kind of paste up there, and they would throw salt on the paste to help it collaborate to the roof. So they would throw the salt. And once they threw the salt on the roof, it began to mix in, and it's no longer good for anything but to have feet walk upon it. So that's what I believe that's what it actually means, is that the salt was used to mix at the pace, and now it's all it's good for is walking upon. The early church, incidentally, read this passage. <laughs> you know what they did? When you came back to the church after you're going away, they'd make you lay on the ground and people would try to walk on you. I'm not making this stuff up. That's taking the Bible out of context. Aren't you glad we don't do that today? We do sometimes. But anyhow, not here at Cornerstone. The other churches do, but we don't because we're better than... No, I'm just kidding. There's a lightning bolt ready to shoot at me in a second. So you're the salt of the earth. And so what does that all mean? Salt is a preservative. How do we preserve... It's getting kind of slippery up here. Got a shuffleboard up here. Um, what does salt do? It preserves. And they had no refrigeration back in those days. It was extremely important. They would take salt. They would rub it on the meats. If they did not, the meat would decay. Listen, everybody. Do you think the meat of our society might be decaying today? Could it be that there's too much salt in the salt shaker and we're not rubbing our salt all around the world? Around our country, around our neighborhoods. God is waiting for us if we just got saved. And listen, just waiting for the rapture is not the answer. Jesus said, occupy till I come again. So it's a preservative. Are we preserving our neighborhoods? Are we preserving the, the school systems? Are we preserving various things? It's an antiseptic as well to get rid of disease. You see, the salt of the gospel, the salt of Jesus is so powerful. It's also used as a seasoning. I mean, uh, come on, thank God for salt, hey? Salt brings out the best in the food. You notice that? You have some food, put a little salt. It kind of brings out the flavor. Let me ask you a question. When someone's with you, do they feel salted? Or are they salted to have more flavor in their lives? We should bring out the best in other people. When people, when you come into a room, oh, I'm so glad they're here. You know people that go into a room, they just suck the life out of the room. And you have the best day in the world. They come in, negative Nancy or, uh, or whatever. I, I don't want to always use a woman's name, but uh, horrible Harold, okay? <laughs> negative Nancy and horrible, horrible Harold are married. And they come in the room and just suck all the oxygen out of the room. I mean, you're happy. You're having the best day in the world. And they're like pig pen from peanuts. They come in with this big cloud and they ruin the day. They're so negative. Uh, everything they say is negative about it. No matter what you say, they're negative. And how about this? How you know people that will enter a room and they'll give life? 
when you're hanging out with them, they bring out the best in you. My friends, the church should bring out the best in society. You should see God's promise in every person and call it out. That's what Jesus did when he saw Zacchaeus in the tree. He didn't see a tax collector. He saw a guy that was going to be giving his life to Christ. When Jesus saw the prostitute, he didn't say, you sinner. He saw the best in her, and he brought out the best in her. What would happen if you and I would go in society and pull out the best of your boss, the best of people, instead of bringing curse, instead of assaulting people with arrogance and religiosity, if we began to bring out the best by seeing God's promise, every single person is made in the image of God and has God's likeness, we should call it out. The salt of Jesus, the salt of the gospel brings out the best in people. That's what we're called to do. Not damn everybody. Not sit there and complain what, what political group they're part of. We're called to bring out the best without losing our salty properties. We're seasoning. Salt is good. But if salt lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's of no use for the soil or the manure pile. I found something else out today. I'm glad we don't do this today. But what they used to do when they would go to the bathroom, okay, I'm sorry, this isn't the Bible, it's just what happened in this culture. They would, you know, do, the, do their business. We call it number two in my house. I'm not going to talk about it, but what they would do, and when they're done, instead of flushing the toilet, you would get salt and you would pour it on it. So what you can do to help save the planet, turn off the water in your toilets <laughs> and just throw salt on it and see how popular you become in your household. But that's what they would do. They'd throw salt on the manure and it, actually, it would actually treat, it would actually treat the excrement and it would be able to be used for, for planting and things of that nature. But if the salt is no good, it's not even good for the manure pile. Now, do I have to bring it to today's language? I'm not going to. Uh, my mother called me up one time and said that one of the pastors she went to see actually used the word. Yes, I'm not going to do it. It is thrown away. Who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let me read it again. Salt is good, but if its salt has lost its taste, how shall it be salty and be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or the manure pile. Listen, everybody. The last thing the world needs is a Mr. Nobody or Mrs. Nobody out there saying how bad everything is and how they're better than everyone else. That's not Christianity. That's a cult. That is, let me just say something really important. Christianity without Jesus is toxic and dangerous. Christianity without the love of Jesus is toxic and dangerous. And this is what can begin to happen in our lives. You are the light of the world. You see, light means more and more as it gets darker. As our culture gets darker, it means more and more. And you're like, what do I have to give? Listen, you are the light of the world. You don't produce the light. Jesus said in one of my favorite scripture verses, it says, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water that the Spirit will give you. You don't produce it. You don't produce the light. The light shines through you. Our job is to reflect the light. You're not called to be the Son of God, but we're called to be like the moon. And by the way, the moon does not produce its own, own light, if you don't realize that. It's a mirror. It's a reflector. It gets in the sun's light and it shines forth. You and I should be reflecting the glory of Almighty God. And that's what it's about. But if our mirror gets dirty, if we're looking down, if we're not looking at Christ, we're looking at our problems, we're looking at our own human solutions. But if we turn our panels towards the heaven and catch the light and shine it, we bring life to where we go. Light brings photosynthesis. Light brings life. Are you bringing life? with the light of Christ, and that's what we're called to do. The moment you think you're this is the moment you're not doing it. We are light, and by the way, the Bible says you are the salt, you are the light of the world. The Greek tense in there, by the way, is, is plural. So he says you, he's talking about the church. So it's not just you by yourself, it's all of us together working as one entity. So we are, so what we have to do is be what we, let me say something. Be what you are, a child of God. Be what you are, salt and light. All we have to do is get the stuff out of the way and let him flow out of us. 
You don't produce, you let God produce through you. It's hard to understand until you start doing it. What you need to start doing is listen to the Holy Spirit. Take a step of faith and the Holy Spirit will give you the grace and power. We'll talk more about it in a few moments. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. Why do we walk around like this? We talked about going to restaurants. You're afraid to pray for your meal. Meanwhile, as I mentioned before, there are people in the parking lot facing towards Mecca. They're not ashamed. People are not ashamed to use the Lord's name in vain. But why are we ashamed to speak his name for thanksgiving and grace? You're a lot of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. You see, this is kind of the lamp they used to have. What they do, they light this lamp, they put it in a room, and they put it in the corner of the room, and they turn it on, and what you want to do is put it high, and you want to put it so it shines forth the whole room. It would go against the limestone, light the limestone as a glow, and go this way, and that's how it would light the room. You have to understand, back in those days, the Eversource wasn't around, so people had money. Um, I have no opinion on the matter. But what happened in those days, light was hard to come by. It, it, and they were afraid. And they thought the darkness was the, where the evil was, and they were afraid. And so light was extremely difficult to get a hold of. It was difficult to, to take care of. And this is what they would do. They'd put oil in it, and they would light their way. You're the light of the world, like a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. We have nothing to be ashamed of. We have to get our light out of the closet. Hello. We should be not arrogant, but we should be proud of God. The last thing we need is another arrogant group of people that think they know everything and damn the whole world. That's called the cancel culture. Have you noticed that? The cancel culture. If you don't do what they say, they cancel you. They cancel each other out. It doesn't work. We're not about that. We're, we're about bringing out the best in people and showing that there's a better way and that there is a heaven and there's a hell and we love people too much to let them go the wrong direction. You see, that's what we're called to do. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. And said a lamp is placed on a stand. We should be a lighthouse. We should put the light as high as we can. It gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out to all the sea. Now, it's a little confusing because Jesus is telling us to do good deeds so everyone can see it. And then the next chapter, he says this, beware of practicing your righteousness before the people in order to be seen. What, Jesus, what is it? Is it, this is why I don't believe the Bible. It contradicts itself. No, it doesn't. You see, in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so they see God, not to have your own works to be seen. Now, it's hard to know what happens with that. In fact, I had a situation a number of years ago. I was at Evangel University. I was, a, I, was a, I was a freshman. I had about $700 left in my account to the end of the semester, which back in those days was probably like $1,200. <laughs> okay? And there was this guy uh, from Kenya whose sister died. He had to go back to Kenya. And I felt like the Lord said, give the whole $700. So I gave it in secret. And then the roommates and all that, a couple of weeks went by. People talked about how wonderful it is. And they asked me, why don't you give money towards this? And I said, that's okay. I, I, I got it. I got it. And so I didn't want to tell anyone. But it got to the point where I couldn't help myself, and I wanted some credit. So I said, yeah, well, I wrote it. I gave $700. And the Lord said, you just lost your blessing. So if anyone feels any sympathy for me, give me $700. No, I'm just kidding. I... <laughs> but the question is, I had the right motive initially. But what happened was, because people were questioning me, I wanted to be seen as important, like I was someone good. So I gave. And this is the, by the way, the first, <laughs> there was a big church cleaning in the book of Acts where Barnabas went and sold a field, brought the money to the disciples, and gave it for a good reason. He loved God and wanted to see God happen. And he did good deeds to be seen by men. And then Ananias and Sapphira said, hmm, this is pretty way. I want to do the same thing. So they sold their field, and they said they gave the money, kept from for themselves, and lied, and they were killed. You see the difference? This is what happened to Satan. I will ascend and make myself like the most high God. When you do good works and you want to be, get credit, don't do it. It's the wrong motive. It's the wrong motive. Listen, we all struggle with it. We all do. And that's what Jesus is talking about. So 
doing good deeds to be seen is good. Why do we want to be seen? In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise you and say what an amazing church you go to and how your pastor's amazing and Cornerstone's the best church in the world. Our pastor has the anointing. Please. Oh, don't walk out, please. I... <laughs> Golly. The moment, let me tell you, when I'm in this mode, this is what happens. I go home. No one likes me. People don't appreciate all the hard work I do. The guy's like, what are you kidding? What are you, are you kidding me? I go, sorry, God. The moment I have a pity party is the moment it's about me. Remember, we've been speaking about the series. Sin complicates your life. The love of God simplifies. It's not about me. It's Christ in me. And so I want to do things so people see Jesus. I want, to do, I, I, I want to be jealous for Jesus' name. I want to make sure that I care about somebody because I don't want to see them go to hell. I want to see, I want to see someone restored. Not about me. About Jesus. That's what we wanted to be about. And so the moment it's about you is the moment you lose your reward. 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 3 talks about that. Whatever you do for God is both here and now. Whatever you do for yourself will burn in the fire. For all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. So we want to do good works in our community. We want to do good works in our community, and that's what we want to do. We want to make a difference. Now, in 2 Corinthians 4, 3, light also uh, brings light to people. It says, check this out. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds. I was just reading through the Bible in a year this morning. Why do I keep mentioning that? Because I want to encourage you to read the Bible. Yep. Talks to me every day, yep. nearly. And this morning, the enemy said to, to Jesus, well, he said to 2,000 years ago, but in my reading this morning, bow down to me, for I have been given the authority. Right now, the authority of this world, under God's command, it's so hard to explain right now, the enemy has an ability to bless people. And temporarily, because he's of this world. So the Bible says, the God of this world has blinded their minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ. For once you were full of darkness, now you're full of light. Now let me just show you what happens, what the enemy does and tries to mess up things. I'm gonna show you a little clip right now about how darkness is coming to our culture and how you and I need to shine the light of reason, understanding, and sanity. Go ahead and show it, please. There's been a lot of talk about identity lately, but how far? There's been there's been a lot of talk about identity lately, but how far does it go? All right, let's just try it again. And is it possible? There's been a lot of Thank talk you. about identity lately, but how far does it go? It's got a stuttering problem. Is it problem. possible to be wrong? We went to the University of Washington to find out. Are you aware of the debate happening in Washington State around um, the ability to access bathrooms, locker rooms, spas based on gender identity and gender expression? I, I think people should be able to have access to the facility. I think people definitely should have the ability to go into whichever locker room they want. If I told you that I was seven years old, what would your response be? Um, I wouldn't believe that immediately. Uh. I probably wouldn't believe it, but I mean, I, it wouldn't really bother me that much to go out of my way and tell you no, you're wrong. I'd just be like, oh, okay, he wants to say he's seven years old. If you feel seven at heart, then, <laughs> then so be it. Yeah, good for you. <laughs> so if I wanted to enroll in a first grade class, do you think I should be allowed to? Uh, probably not, I guess. I mean, unless you haven't completed first grade up to this point and for some reason need to do that now. If I told you I'm six feet, five inches, what would you say? That I would question. Why? <laughs> because you're not. <laughs> no, I don't think you're six foot five. If you truly believed you're six five, I don't think it's harmful. I think it's fine if you believe that. It doesn't matter to me if you think you're taller than you are. <laughs> so you'd be willing to tell me I'm wrong? I wouldn't tell you you're wrong. No, but I say that um, I'd don't think that you are. I feel like that's not my place as like another human to say someone is wrong or to draw lines or boundaries. So I can be a Chinese woman. You... <laughs> um, sure. 
but I can't be a six foot five Chinese woman. Yes. If you thoroughly debated me or explained why you felt that you were six foot five, uh, I feel like I would be very open to saying that you were six foot five or Chinese or a woman. It shouldn't be hard to tell a 5'9 white guy that he's not a 6'5 Chinese woman. But clearly it is. Why? What does that say about our culture? And what does that say about our ability to answer the questions that actually are difficult? It is salt and light in these situations. That's insanity. It does damage to a society to believe this malarkey. It's, it, are there people that have mental health issues? Yes. Are there people who are confused? Yes. Doesn't mean that we change all society. I've heard stories. Listen, I understand there's gender, gender dysphoria, and I understand. I'm not going to get into those such situations, excuse me. Is that I've heard people, a pastor friend of mine told me that a woman, a, a mother came to his office and said, I don't know what to do with the school system. Little Johnny came home, whatever his name was, in third grade and was crying. She said, what's your problem? He said, Mommy, I'm a boy. They say I might be a girl. I don't want to be a girl. Why do we have to do that to a little child? Right? Now, what's easy to do is to get ticked off, get self-righteous, come in with the Bible, Bible says I, and go like that at the school board meeting. I ain't going to do any good. Jesus says you'd be those wise as serpents and what? Arrogant like a Christian? No. What does he say? Wise as a serpent and gentle as a dove. We need to be smart. We got to bring the light. All truth is God's truth. We have the truth on our side. We can talk about chromosomes. We can talk about doing damage to someone's psychological damage. We can talk about irreparable damage that takes place. And there are books that are out there that talk about people from, written from secularists and atheists. Who's, who even, even Bill Maher is even against this, which like, what? So, you know, don't, never mind, you know who he is, but that's beside the point. That when you're messing with a little child like that, that's damage. What do we have to do? We got to shine the light of board meetings. We don't swear at them. We bring respect. By the way, the job of unbelievers is to be, okay? So they don't know better. So we need to shine the light and show them the truth. We need to pull out the best in them. We need to have facts facts and listen everybody we have the truth if you if again if you look at the, the evidence and you're really honest with the evidence the evidence speaks for itself now are there broken people out there absolutely are there people with all sorts of issues yes a very small very small percentage but right now what's happening people are being recruited to this whole groups of girls are coming together and all changing their identity together, been on hormones, and then they can't have kids for the rest of their lives. And some people are beginning to sue people for their parents doing these things to them now that they're older. So this is an example of the insanity what begins to happen. Do, do you see what I'm saying here, everybody? So what do we do? We bring the truth in humility and light. You can say that you're made in God's image and I care about you too much to let you drink toxins that will kill you. If someone is driving to a bridge that is out, I need to tell them, I'm not gonna swear at them, you stupid idiot, get off the road. No, I'm gonna say stop and, and do all I can to stop that person to help them. Realizing it was not for the grace of God, you, you couldn't stand either. So the God of this age has blinded their minds. So we need to be salt and light. We need to be smart about it. We need to have facts, investigations. I don't know how to do that. There's people out there that can do that. And if you really have an honest debate, and don't, don't tear someone apart and call them an idiot, but say, listen, I, I respect your views that you have. However, the truth, is, <laughs> the truth is this, and show the truth and back it up. We have nothing to be ashamed of. Truth, all truth, is God's truth. Does that make sense? So we need to be, have light. We need to be involved with school boards. I'm going to wait till Jesus comes back. You see what happened in the early part of this century? There was a movement, kind of like Kingdom Now, where we thought we were going to usher in the second coming of Jesus. And the reason why they thought that was pretty obvious. The Industrial Revolution happened. We were, you know, we're starting to do all these amazing things, and governments were getting better. Kings were going away, and, and things were getting better. And people were like, he's going to come back. And then World War I happened, smashed that ideology started to come back again, and World War II happened. People were like, okay, that doesn't work. But now we have an escapism mentality. 
We're not going to get involved with the world. We're just going to, we're just going to come to church. We're going to collect in our salt, our salt containers. And we're just going to, you know, eat Caleb. Uh, and just, nothing wrong with Caleb. We're just going to be in church all. And we're going to stay in a salt container. And we're going to stay out in here. But guess what? The world is needing salt. The word is needing light. And you are the salt. And you are the light. Jesus says, go into all the world. He doesn't say, stay in the church. Now, the church is good. It's like a briefing room. A place to encourage each other. A place to keep each other's salt properties good. To keep your light brighter. But we're not called just to stay in here and not go out there. God's calling you to go out there. What does that mean? talking to a school teacher just this morning and he has people that he, they don't know who they are in the classrooms and he shows them love and he prays for them and they start opening up to him you can go into a classroom and say i declare the kingdom of god is here god i pray you to make an open heaven where people would know who you are and show them love and god will open up opportunities for you and you can, go, you can go to the school board. You can go to your boss and say, like, for example, a friend of mine also teaching Spanish. And they're trying to take away Spanish. I don't know if you realize this. Spanish has a lot of feminine and, and masculine ver, uh, endings on it. And they're trying to take away hundreds and hundreds of years of Spanish. And, no, you can't put gender. It's ridiculous. I cannot teach. The, I, that, that's dishonest to the language. You are insulting people all around the world, he said. And he won out. Because he became salt and he became light. So that's how it works, partially. Does that make sense? But don't act like a political operative. Don't act like a person on television that rips people apart. Don't put the banner of a political party on, stand outside the political party, speak the truth into it, but don't align yourself and make yourself a Republican or Democrat. Like, we can vote a certain way. You follow me? But we come outside of that authority because that taints us. All right, I'm not going to get any further than that because I'll get myself into trouble. Okay, this world has been blinded by the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ. For once, Ephesians says, you are full of darkness. That's all of you. Maybe you're still full of darkness. But now you have light from the Lord. Where does the light come from? Does it come from my hard work? It comes from the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good, right, and true carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part of the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, what? Expose them by putting the light on it. Show what's going on. It is shameful even to talk about the things that the ungodly people do, those outside, right? To do in secret. But their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines upon them. For the light makes everything visible. That's why it is said, awake, O sleeper. Awake, O cornerstone. Awake, O Eric. Awake, whatever your name is. Rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. You don't have to produce the light. All you have to do is receive the light, clean the mirror enough so it can shine off of you. So be careful of how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. So we want to make a difference in the world. Now, so interesting in this passage of scripture we talked about today, uh, where Jesus was speaking, he said this, light to everyone in the house, he says. It brings light to everyone in the house. So the first place we got to bring light to is in our own homes. Oh, it's easy to go out there and talk about the light. But boy, it's hard to show the light when mom and dad tell you to turn off the computer games. It's hard to shine the light when they don't listen about turning off the computer games and you want to shine some things on them. You know, it's easy to, to be in church all the time. I'm helping the Lord and blow off your spouse and blow off your kids. How about be light in your own house and in your own home and good deeds shine out for all to see beyond the home and world. So the church should be known what we're for, not what we're against. And so we're for people having life. Believe me, there are thousands of people out there that don't like the insanity that's going on right now in the world. They're waiting for someone to stand up and be a leader. It's time for the church to stand up and be leaders. Servant leaders, not arrogant idiots. I'm sorry. 
The last thing we need is another religious fanatic up there thinking they're better than somebody else. We had to do it humbly. Let, let me just say it this way. If you bring correction to the school board and you enjoy it, don't say anything. If you bring correction to someone and you enjoy bringing correction because you feel, oh, I'm going to kill them. They deserve Don't do it. If you bring correction and it breaks your heart because you hate to see people suffer, bring it. You see the difference? Jesus saw the crowds. He was moved with compassion for they were sheep without a shepherd. You are the light of the earth. And so what do we want to do? We want to make a difference right now. We make differences right now, but we know, no, right now we have an opportunity. What's going on in Ukraine right now? I want to thank you all last week. There's no pressure involved. I just want to give you an opportunity, okay? You pray about it and do what you want to do with the Lord. Last week we were able to raise $17,000 so far. That's good. Yeah. But Convoy of Hope is one of the greatest organizations uh, for benevolence around the world. It's fantastic. It is, it's very well tested and all that. And so I was praying this past week, and I've, I've been bothered by this whole Ukraine thing. I, I mean, I'm not trying to say this to, please understand, I'm not trying to brag, but there's some nights I couldn't even sleep. My wife and I could not sleep thinking about Ukraine. But you know what I find happens? I get used to it, and then I start forgetting about it. I don't want to be that way. I want to continue to pray. We see the suffering going around. So I so said, what can we do? I said, so, well, you can get a container. How much? 42,000. The Lord said, do it. That's, I mean, I just, I, I don't always hear the Lord, but I heard, I, something jumped inside of me. You're going to do it. It's going to happen. So we're going to get a container. For, uh, somehow or another, I don't know how, but it's going to happen. $42,000 to serve over 3,000 people in Ukraine with baby diapers and all sorts of things. We're putting the kits together. We're, we're actually talking to the people that sell it. We're going to also talk to some uh, box stores and see if they'll get a better price on diapers and stuff. I'm sure they'll want to help. And we're going to do all we can, and we're going to be able to bless at least 3,000 people and send a container. It takes about, you fill the container. What we're going to do is order all the material here, right? And we're going to, we're going to broadcast what we're doing. Not so, Cornerstone's the best church. They give money to the poor. No, I, if that's, the, no that's not what we want to do. We want to do good deeds to show that we're not about, we're about helping people. It's about Jesus Christ. But we're not dumb about it. Say, what's going on? It's all Jesus. Pastor, it was a great sermon. It's all Jesus. No, it wasn't all Jesus because your sermon wasn't that good. <laughs> okay, let's not be silly about that. Instead, say, you know what? We believe that God is the answer and God tells us to be salt and light. And that's our, we're here to make the world a better place through Jesus Christ. And I'm not a perfect person. We're not a perfect church. And there's a lot of great churches out there, even in this town but we feel we gotta do what we're called to do. That's how you shine the light. How many wanna go with me on this thing? Let's do it, come on, let's do this. Amen? So, you pray and you ask God and you do what you wanna do. I'm not gonna put, you know, we're not gonna take you out to dinner and you know, make you go ride a mechanical bull and all this other stuff and hire comedians to make you happy so you get money. That's what some people do. I'm not gonna do that nonsense. You pray, you ask the Lord, and you do what he tells you to do. And I'm confident. By the way, thank you. We were able to send over $35,000 to India to help India with their crisis with um, COVID and help thousands and thousands of people. Thank you, everybody, for that. So listen, we're about doing the kingdom of the Lord. And it's a beautiful what we can accomplish when we don't care who gets the credit except for Jesus Christ. It's the one of the most wonderful feelings in the world is when you're not about yourself. You know why? You're not created to live for yourself. When you live for yourself, you hurt yourself. When you live for God, you become the true you. It's beautiful to do something and not feel like if someone doesn't like it, I don't care as long as Jesus is glorified. That's the way to do it. Don't say, well, our church, is, what is your church doing? Our, please don't say that. Please don't say our church. Unless you say, you know, we're doing the best we can at Cornerstone. We want to make a difference, and I'm sure your church wants to do the same thing too. Hello? You see that? No more this celebrity cult. God's smashing the celebrity culture right now in the world. All these pastors are dropping like flies. All this band fair, and we're the best. God's like, enough, and he's shaking the tree. And I hope he doesn't shake too much because I can fall too. But God's looking for people to say, we want to give him glory. We want to give him grace in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. So the church does not exist for itself. It exists for the world. 
Remember like I said before, if, if, I mean, the small light can disperse the greatest darkness. You are the salt of the earth and you're the light of the earth, of the world. That's what you are, everybody. That's what you are. We're called to be that. Remember, everybody, if, if God didn't want to do this, we'd be in heaven already. There's a reason why you're on earth. I don't care if you're 85 or 90. God might have you in a season to intercede and pray. If you're 25, maybe he's calling you to go around the world on a mission trip. Maybe God's calling you to start a business so you can make money and give it and help people. Maybe God is giving you the ability to do amazing things. Listen, everybody, whatever stage you're in, don't compare yourself to other people, but share and work together. Old, young, middle, what's more, work together. Amen? And let me just tell you something. We, I'm really, I don't want to say too much, but we, we are investing in the next generation. You're going to be hearing an announcement real soon about how we're investing in the next generation. We're believing for young people to be on fire for God, young people to be trained up, young people sent around the world on mission trips, young people finding their calling in Christ, young people changing their school systems, and we we're investing in that. You're going to be hearing more about that in a couple of weeks. Amen? Amen? So... This is not about come and get entertained. This is about, this is, a, this is a war room. This is a place where we get together. This is a briefing room. And then we go out and we do our act. Whatever God's called you to do. I don't care if you're a mechanic. I don't care if you're a, a doctor or a lawyer or if you're a stay-at-home mom or dad. I don't care if you're a school bus driver. And we know a school bus driver that's doing an amazing thing. She takes a young boy, begins to speak to him and helps him know God and brings him to church. What a bus driver that is, praise God. That's what we're called to do. Do you see it, everybody? I hope you're seeing this. The days are evil. We need God. The church needs God. The world needs God. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so much for today. I thank you, God, that you are a good God. I want to thank you, Father, you've called us to be salt, and you've called us to be light, and God, we want to be salt and light in this place. Father, we don't want to be a place of entertainment. Father, we don't want to be a place where we have nice music and technology that's up to date and people that look sort of cool, except for me. God, we're not about that. We don't want, God, God, for, God forbid us for being about ourselves. Forbid us, oh God, for me being about myself. God, I don't want to be about myself. I don't want this church to be about myself or about the church. Lord, I want the church to be about you. Lord, we want to shine all the glory to you humbly, realizing somehow, some way, you're going to work through our broken people to, to heal a broken world. Father, I pray that you would work through us each and every one of us. Father, we're praying, Lord, I'm believing you told me to do this. I'm going to believe you're going to provide more than enough that we're able to help thousands of people in Ukraine in this dire time of need that's going to go on for months and months and months. Father, that we make a difference in our school boards and make a difference in town, that we make a difference in our, in our communities and our workplaces. Father, that we would stand up in the power of your might as wise as serpents and gentle as doves, that we would help each other, Lord God. Father, you have us here for a reason. God, we're not interested in going to church and going home, and that's it. We're here for a reason, oh God. Move in our hearts, move in our minds. We pray for structures and plans that will help mobilize all of us in every stage of life and every gifting in Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let me ask you a question. The most important thing I do every single week in regards to your life is this. How are you with Jesus? If you were to die right now, do you absolutely positively know you'd be in heaven? Do you absolutely know that? Well, I hope so. If you don't, Listen, I can tell you right now. If I were to die right now, I, I'm more confident that I'd be in heaven with Christ than I'm standing on the stage. I'm that confident in Christ. You can be too. You see, one day you're going to have to face God. And you're full of sin and so am I. We need a Savior. You can't save yourself. I've said it before. I'll say it again. If I were to bring you to the Long Island Sound and I would tell you to swim from here to England, no one could do it. But there's only one way you can do it. To get on a vessel. To submit yourself and put faith in the vessel. That vessel is Jesus Christ that I put myself upon Christ. I let him cover me. And he is the way. He is the truth and he is the life. 
So if you've never done that, today's the day to begin your journey with him. Maybe you used to walk with God and you're going your own way. Maybe you never gave your life to Jesus. Listen, everybody, let me say something very important here. You believe in Jesus, so what? Maybe you even serve in church, so what? You know what saves you? Believing in Jesus Christ and giving your life completely to him, you're no longer in charge anymore. If, you're not, if you haven't done those two things, you're not a Christian. You're not a believer in Christ. You only like the Christian philosophy, but you don't have a relationship. It's not a philosophy. It's not a religion. It's a relationship, and it happens through Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to pray right now. Maybe some of you have never given your life to Christ. Today is the day. Maybe some of you want to get right. Come on. Let's be bold here this morning. At home as well. Just, just raise your hand. Anyone say, I want to give my life to Christ for the first time. I want to renew my commitment. Anyone this morning? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I see that. Thank you. I'm back there. I see you. More important, the Lord sees you. Hey, I'm just, I got there a little bit before you, but we're on the same path, everybody. Let's pray this prayer, and as well as those that are watching online. Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross and rose again from the dead. Today, I step down from being in charge of my life. I hand my life over to you. Take my life. I also pray you forgive me of everything I've ever done wrong, both known and unknown. And I choose, with your help from this day forward, to follow you. Thank you that I am now born again and I am a child of you, based upon what you did on the cross and the confession of my mouth in Jesus' name. Amen. If you could look up here real quick, there is a, there is a connection card in the front pocket of your seat. Pull it out. Say, my decision today. Also, for those that are home or watching, you can text and go on your phone and text BELIEF to 860-499-4888. That's 860-499-4888. Now, I want to just end with this. Remember, everybody, we're not about gimmicks. You ask the Lord what to do. And so these are four different ways you can give for our tithes and offerings. If you want to give to Ukraine, please write Ukraine. Everything you put there will go towards this effort. And we're going to, and hopefully in a couple of weeks, we're going to have an assembly line out here. We're going to invite people to come. We're going to put these packets together. We're going to have a forklift. We need someone to donate a forklift to help us use. We need a lot of help. And we're going we're gonna to put the container over there. We're going to fill it up. And with God's grace, we're going to mail it. We're going to ship it over to Poland and get to Ukraine. Amen? So there are four different ways we can do it, okay? That's all right, you can go ahead. Um, in the back, there are boxes there, too. You can put your envelopes there. So this is how we give. Father, bless this offering today. Lord, we thank you. You're the God that provides. God, this is not even our money, not even our own life. You own it all. And so we trust your word, and we thank you that you're faithful in all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are the light of the world, a city on a hill that should not be hidden. Let your light shine before men so they would glorify your Father who is in heaven. The Lord bless you. God bless you guys. Mm -hmm.